This isn't a dinosaur. All right. Uh, you see Dimetrodon. This is clearly a Dimetrodon, by the way. Uh, you see Dimetrodon in a lot of dinosaur toy sets because it's a prehistoric reptile and it sort of has fit into the dinosaur category in the popular culture, more so at least than, you know, woolly mammoth or the Smilodon or what have you. It was not a dinosaur. It was a synapsid. What's a synapsid, you ask? Well, a synapsid is an animal with a synapse. A synapse is, uh, take your fingers. Put one uh, uh, right behind your, your orbit, behind your eye, uh, on your temple. That's what this is called. This is called your temple. And then uh, one behind your cheekbone on the fleshy part of your mouth there, and then squeeze. And you'll feel this ridge of bone going back towards the top of your ear. That is your synapse. Congratulations, you're a synapsid. You are more closely related to Dimetrodon than Dimetrodon was to any dinosaur that ever lived. Reptiles diverged at the beginning of the Permian period, right before this guy showed up. About 300 million years ago, this guy would have been 290 to 270 million years ago. Uh, that diverged into those that had two holes in their skull and those that had three. Scratch that. Those that had one hole in their skull and those that had two. I was counting the orbit when I counted those up, but I wasn't counting the nose. So anyway, you have synapsids, which are these, uh, and diapsids, which includes all living reptiles and birds. And I mentioned this was the Permian period. That was, you know, geologic period before the Triassic, and dinosaurs did not show up before the Triassic. So this fellow died off 40 million years before dinosaurs ever even appeared on the scene. The world was very different then. It was cooler but warming up. Uh, Pangaea had only just formed, so the, the climate was changing rapidly. And, and this guy thrived in an environment where you didn't really have to be mobile or particularly efficient in order to make a living as top predator, which we figure it was because it's rather large. It was, what, 10 meters long at most? I think I mean 10 feet. 10 meters would be really long. Yeah, 10 feet. So in addition to being separated, you know, relationally in the tree of life and by time period, they're also separated physiologically. The most obvious difference is the skull. And I know it might seem kind of arbitrary to say, well, there's two lineages of land vertebrates uh, and they're differentiated by a hole in the skull, but that's the point of divergence. Uh, Archosaurs had that extra hole in the front and it made their skulls lighter and they were able to be more mobile. Uh, that was not their only mobility adaptation, but it was an important one. Dimetrodon had a rather solid, heavy skull on it, and they, they, they have the skull a little incorrectly shaped. There, there should be more of a swoop going up towards the snout and the, the premaxillary bone, the very front of the mouth has this sort of snaggletooth thing going on. Speaking of the teeth, Dimetrodon means uh, uh, two measures of tooth, which is weird because it actually had more like three. It had basically incisors at the front of its mouth, and then what we would call canines, but apparently they weren't true canines, and then it had smaller teeth going towards the back of the mouth. This is in contrast to, you know, archosaurs or any dinosaur, except Heterodontosaurus, hence the name, because dinosaurs would tend to have one type of tooth per mouth, unless they had a beak, in which case they would have beak and teeth which is kind of a clever way of getting around that, if we can call macroevolution clever. Speaking of the snout, uh, there's evidence that there's these ridges on the, the top of the snout where, where there, that could have been an attach point for a cartilage structure. So even in such an early synapsid, we're already seeing the very beginnings of what we would call a nose. Uh, it probably only looked like any other reptile, but that's another divergence from dinosaurs, which, you know, pretty classic uh, uh, 
skin stretched over the top of the skull snout going on with them. Getting into the gait, the, the posture of the creature. Uh, probably one of the reasons that Dimetrodon is so popular to include with dinosaurs is that it fits so well into the, the conception of dinosaurs as sluggish, sprawling lizard creatures, because that's sort of what this was. It was active, but it wasn't particularly mobile. Like, it had the sprawling gait, like a lizard. Uh, it would lift its body up to move, but it rested with its body on the ground, whereas dinosaurs and mammals uh, have their legs under them to, to rest. Not to sleep, necessarily, but to, to they don't have to lift up to move and then set down to, to rest. They, they're, they're much more efficiently built. He's got a pretty robust tail, too. Uh, Dimetrodon had a rather long tail, like one-third to one-half of its length uh, was tail, but it was skinny. It was, even that was slightly mammalian-looking, what we would call mammalian-looking, with the uh, sort of maybe dragging it out on the ground, but probably just holding it slightly off the ground, whereas a dinosaur would be using it for balance. It would, it would be this big S-curved muscular thing. And there's a lot I could say about the difference between a Dimetrodon's hip and a dinosaur's hip, but I've talked so much about dinosaur hips already, you can probably imagine. Ankles, too, for that matter. Point is, after the Permian-Triassic extinction, which is when, you know, 95% of all life on Earth was dead, that's when dinosaurs were able to emerge. This guy and most of his descendants and all of his ecosystem had to collapse in order to create a world in which dinosaurs could thrive because they were more efficient and, and capable of existing in that sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland that was the early to mid-Triassic. Which is all I can really think of as far as Dimetrodon not being a dinosaur. This has been Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Thank you for watching. Uh, please go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate. You could even like, comment, and subscribe. Comment with dinosaurs that you'd like me to take apart. Uh, you could even send me a toy dinosaur to have on the show. Our address is in the description. We will see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.